Hey, everybody. Welcome to Naturalistics, a podcast dedicated to helping you become a better naturalist. My name is Stefan, and on the other end of the line is Matt. What's up? We are super excited to be bringing episode 16, our 16th episode. We're going to be talking, we're diving into the subject of bird language. Super excited for this. I'll be actually teaching a class in a couple weeks on this, and uh, it's a good, good warm-up for that and getting us set up. just want to take a second to, to thank everyone for listening and sharing all the love on social media and stuff like that. You can find us uh, Facebook now. we got a Facebook page, so dun, check dun, that out. Dun. We don't really post there very much, <laughs> but you can find us there. Uh, Twitter, you can find us on Twitter and also Instagram. So all over the social media. Follow us. Like us. Share us, whatever. Tell people we exist. I think that's the main thing. So how's yeah. it going, Stefan? It's going pretty well. Yeah, we're rolling into spring here. It's a kind of a slow, slow transition. We had a lot of sort of cooler, cooler weather, but birds are moving back in, which is one of the reasons I'm really excited to be get, to get into talking about some bird stuff on the podcast. We've got Phoebe's back. I don't know if oh, you've had you have Phoebe's, Phoebe's up here. Nope. Nope. Yeah, Phoebe's, Phoebe's, are, Phoebe's are back. Piping plovers. Woodcocks. So, We've been listening to woodcocks a lot yep. at our backyard, yep. and uh, yep. they're so awesome. The plink, yep. just like, it's so <laughs> nice in the evening. We open up the window, and we just listen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're the, they're the best. If you live somewhere where you have them, like right near your house, like that's the best way to experience woodcocks. Yeah. They're, they're kind of hard to go and find. The like, lazy naturalist going, bird. Would, yeah, they are definitely. <laughs> <laughs> like, come to me, uh, Scolopax Miner. <laughs> and uh nice <laughs> yeah because i remember when we lived at paul's down by york beach oh, yeah, we had them in the back and that was like the best to sit on the porch and, and listen to them in the evening hey man so. you never gotta find a wife in the woods <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was our old landlord he's awesome yeah all nice. right so <laughs> big big news for us at the podcast you know we've we've reached i don't know almost ten thousand downloads and we're getting to the point where you know, we spend a lot of time on the episodes, and we and we're we're we've actually a lot of people have been asking about ways to contribute, and you know, we want to keep the thing, the train going, we want to keep uh, producing the podcast, and so we created a Patreon account, which you can donate a small amount of money per month, or you know, however much you feel comfortable with, and it's I mean, totally really optional. Is just pay but for if you want to, you can donate a dollar a month. For, you can do, the donate five dollars uh, a month. Whatever is going to fit yeah. um, your budget. But also, it's important to note that we're going to continue to create free content, and these episodes are going to keep going. But if you'd like to help out, you know, we do have some expenses, and we're trying to figure out ways to cover those. And you can find it at patreon.com slash naturalistics pretty easy so check it out there's some cool perks too like t-shirts and prints things like that so check it out great yeah all right and we've got our listener question of the month let's see so this one comes from jake from new york jake says i see birds everywhere in the city and in the country where are all the dead birds where do they die when they do, are they so quickly snatched up by scavengers that we barely see them at all? To see a bird in the sky or in a tree is commonplace, but to see a dead bird on the ground is, by comparison, extremely rare. You would think there would be just as many dead birds laying around as ones flying in the air. So what do you think, Great. Stephen? I, you think? I, well, first of all, I really want to thank Jake for uh, the question. And I actually have a friend named Jake who lives in New York. Maybe Not, it's him. I'm sure, I'm sure there are many Jakes in New York, but yeah. I, I think I think it's an interesting question, and to me, as as is often the case, it it sort of kind of other questions start to bubble up, you know, when we start to look for maybe an explanation for what Jake's seeing and what probably many other people have have noticed that yeah, there is, there aren't a lot of dead birds around, and one of the first questions I think of is, okay, what kills birds? You know, it's not always the same thing. There's probably s several different contributing factors to bird mortality old age being maybe one of the smallest <laughs> things it's hard you know mm. the life of a bird is fraught with danger as we're going to probably be discussing <laughs> moving forward right. into this episode and uh, but yeah so there's predators thing you know other animals that eat birds it could be other birds it could be m mammalian pre predators yeah there's there's a whole slew of vicious creatures that are that are just waiting to pluck a 
tasty little songbird as a snack. And so in that instance, I, I would think that you don't see the dead bird. You might see some feathers. Because it's in um, some animal's stomach, basically. Yeah, because they, they, you know, animals don't have – don't always have the luxury of like waiting around to – you know, until it's dinner time to eat their dinner. They, you know, when they when they get dinner, they're eating it. What? Yeah. <laughs> and and until it's gone, in many cases, especially especially with birds, they're small enough. I think for most most of the things that are going after them, that it's not more than one meal. A single bird is usually not more than one meal for most predators. So there's not going to be like a carcass that is returned to, and you know, or cached, and and you know, as it would be the case with like a deer or something. So so that's predators. I think when I see dead birds, oftentimes it's because of ro- they're a roadkill, like they yeah. had a collision with an automobile. And I think in that case, the car isn't trying to kill the bird. And so there's not really – there's maybe more time before before scavengers might come in, as Jake yeah. mentions, to scoop that one up. So like I found – you know, as an example, I found a dead um, ruffed grouse recently that was pre- you know fairly freshly hit. You know, it was, it was definitely uh, – broken neck just you know boom dead mm-hmm. and it was sitting there right on the side of the road so those those birds kind of probably stick around a little bit more but then yeah scavengers will come in nothing is wasted really you know i'm actually matt i'm reminded of you talking about being in the rainforest oh boy and <laughs> and pooping Don't, oh i and, knew you were gonna and, tell us oh my god it's like within min- no, i think it's really cool it's a great you know for us living in like northern sort of temperate northern hemisphere climate the insects that yeah. are you know that come and and you know consume like even though they're so small there's so many of them that they yeah. ju- like stuff just disappears like wait, wait. i think we need to provide some clarity you just dropped this the pooping story but did not explain anything <laughs> well why don't you why don't you explain what how long a poop lasts in the rainforest okay so well basically i mean some friends and i we were in the rainforest and like one of my friends in particular was really interested to see how long a poop would, you know, hang around. <laughs> God, this makes me uncomfortable. But so he pooped and then he like timed his po- how long it took for the poop to be gone. And the record, you know, because we were there for months, so we did this a lot. The record was like five minutes until there was not a single trace of it left. So literally the second you would poop outside, you know, in the rainforest, there would be like within... 30 seconds there would be beetles and flies and like butterflies even and moths just coming in and and taking little bits and pieces away and obviously in new york we're not talking about you know where jake lives we're not talking about that kind of speed but um that still is happening though you know it's not especially not in the winter yeah so scavengers are extremely efficient is basically that's kind of like my, my the impression yeah. that that story left on me yeah, That's and why that, I recall that. And mammalian um, scavengers are like bringing them into like places that are less visible, right? So like you know, raccoons are pulling these bird, a bird carcass into the bushes and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. my guess is they're 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 more hidden too. Is an is an element of this. So yeah. And then the other th- thing I was going to mention is that in cities in particular, um, there are people. They're like they're some people's jobs are to take care of like the dead animals and things like that so literally there's like a whole segment of people that are are cleaning up the city and and that might be happening at times when you're not you know seeing it basically i think another cool thing to to think about like another i don't know angle on this is that the the idea that oh there's i see so many birds around so why don't we see more dead birds you see a lot of birds because of their habits their their sort of pattern of activity there a lot of birds are alert and active during the day they're they are sort of out of reach of people they don't really necessarily see people as threat as threatening as maybe some other sort of ground creatures would and so they're more they're a little bit bolder i guess i would say around people so you end up seeing a disproportionate number of birds compared to other wildlife and agree and you also don't see a lot of dead you know mice or small mammals you know a lot of other things that are that are very numerous even in the city that you just don't see because they're active at night or they're more surreptitious in their behavior so i think that's a, that's another interesting thing it's not just bird 
uh, remains that you don't see. It's really the remains of all sorts of mm-hmm. creatures right. that are that are yes, yeah, surprisingly absent. <laughs> it's a it's a cool question. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, thank you. All right, so let's get down to, get down to the topic. Yeah, and um, pretty excited because Stefan came up with this idea, which is. We're going to be doing a three-part series, actually, on bird language. We kind of sat down and started talking about, you know, ideas because we really wanted we've wanted to cover this topic for a while, and we it, pretty soon it, it quickly turned into realizing that we couldn't really fit it all. What what we wanted to do wouldn't fit into one of our episodes, and we didn't want to make a super long episode, um, so we decided we're going to do a series, which is pretty sweet. First series that we're going to do, mm-hmm. and so it's going to be three parts. First part is going to be this one, which you're listening to right now, which is, what is bird language? So we're going to be asking that question. It's a good place to start. We'll see where we go with that. And then the second question, what's the second question, Stefan? Yeah, so, so the next question is, why does it exist? And this is, there's going to be sort of, this is going to go down two roads. There's sort of like the human angle, and then there's sort of like the evolutionary angle, or at least that's where I see, I see it going. And there's, there's a lot to explore there. Why, yeah, why does this not just the concept, but why does the actual yeah. thing, why does the actual phenomena, yeah, why phenomenon is, exist? Why is this something that's pretty pretty easily observable? And then the third part is going to be what are its implications for naturalists? In other words, like what? how can we put this to use? What are some tips and tools that we can use to really learn this stuff? And that's going to yeah. be of interest to a lot of people I'm sure who want to who want to practice bird language and what would like to know how they can do that. So, we'll get to yeah. that. It's a couple episodes away, but we really what we really wanted to do is lay a foundation here with this first one, what is bird language? We really wanted to make sure that we like in our first episode, episode 1, where we talked about what is a naturalist. I mean, the whole podcast is about how to be a good naturalist or what we think, I guess, how people become good naturalists through practice. Mm-hmm. And so in that episode, we asked that question, well, the question, what is a naturalist? Because we, if we're going to be helping people become better naturalists, then we got to figure out what that is. That's and the clear starting point. The same thing is true of bird language, that we really just want to make sure we know what our goals are and what, and what, we're, what we're shooting for what, and what the phenomena is like to, in order to practice it and learn about it. So we yeah. it's kind of like I was using, using this analogy – but it's kind of like if we want to know, want to practice basketball, but we've never even heard of basketball. And so, and so we go to somebody and say, well, what's basketball? And then they just start explaining all the rules. You know, like you can't double dribble and you like, you know, this is a free throw and like this is Your how head you is in- going to spin. <laughs> inbound the pass and like all that kind of stuff. And we... We didn't want to go there. We didn't want to get into all the nitty gritty. That's going to be episode three, probably. But we wanted to start off with what is basketball or what is bird language? Like it's a ball where you bounce a ball and throw it into some hoops. <laughs> yeah, kind of that. Like the the simple sort of one liner explanation of what bird language is, which is which, as you'll see, is it's kind of tricky to put your finger on. Um, but we're going to take a stab at it. Yeah, just like with what is a naturalist, we're going to take a stab at it, and we'd love to hear your feedback. Of course, let us know what you think. So our goal of this episode is to is to reach some kind of like place where where we have a launching point for the next couple episodes and, and beyond. So here we go. Good. I'm going to start off yeah. with a story. All right. So I'm going to kick it off with a little story. This is going to be like a little primer before we dive into the question. Um, Cause this is kind of, to me, it's like a little, it's like a quintessential bird language story and it hits a lot of elements that I think are important to the overall, like the practice and the, and the idea of, of what, of what we're trying to do here. So, a couple of years ago, I was uh, hanging out by a marsh in the early morning. I actually did a little solo camp out by this marsh, and uh, woke up in the morning, and it was, you know, mid spring. So there were there was a lot of bird activity at this marsh, and a lot of song sparrows in particular, and a lot of singing song sparrows. And the tr- the leaves hadn't quite come in yet, so it was very visible hardwood forest all around. And so I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden I start to hear this alarm of song sparrows. It's like, chip, 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 chip. So there, these, these song sparrows are alarming, and I'm watching, I'm waiting, I'm thinking, hmm, what's going on here? And then this deer comes out 
from the vegetation and moves across the other side of the marsh. So I'm sitting on one side, deer's crossing on the other side, and uh, these song sparrows are sort of quietly alarming at this deer moving through. Deer goes through, goes out of sight, and, you know, within, you know, 30 seconds, the song sparrows started to die down, and they and they went back to singing. So, went back to quiet. And then the song sparrows started going off again. But this time, they were, like, a little more incessant. It was like... And there was a lot of them, and they were kind of moving, moving with whatever this disturbance was. And... Pretty shortly after that, I noticed that a coyote came out following, you know, mm. in the same direction that the deer was going and was causing this more intense alarm sequence of the song sparrows. So, and then the coyote goes out of sight. And then, you know, it took a couple minutes for the song sparrows to chill out, die back down, and then go back to singing. Mm. So, and that's the end of the story. I mean, it's pretty simple. But it's basically what's happening is the song sparrows were indicating the presence of something else, you know, something moving through. And in the one case, the deer, they're more relaxed, but they're still at, like a little aggravated by the deer moving through. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe it's the way, maybe it was the body language of the deer. Maybe it's the, how fast it was moving. Maybe, who knows? But, they, but it's creating a ripple, and then the coyote moves through and creates a bigger ripple. Because maybe the coyote is perceived as a predator, um, as a danger. So that's like a really uh, basic bird language story in some ways. And it, it all comes from the idea, basically, of the birds telling us things that are going on, essentially. And that's basically what it is. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. And it's not, it's not so much that they're telling us. It's more, it's more like, it's like the difference between a phone call or a radio broadcast, right? They're just they're just putting a signal out there. And it's if you turn your radio to the right, you know, if you if you turn the dial to the right station to the right frequency, you're going to pick up that signal and get that message. Yeah, agreed. Definitely. So as as far as like you you, you in that story picking up that message, you are paying you're paying attention to the sparrows alarm calls right. and that's how you sort of d- determined that there is something happening to create that ripple yeah um, exactly and and that it's re- and it's really simple we want to kind of emphasize that it, there's a si- really simplistic element to bird language that can be get over complicated and it's not what i'm not what i wasn't doing was i wasn't like birding on an extreme level i wasn't extreme birding like i wasn't like running around trying to checklist off everything I knew about birds and then, you know, gleaning some bird language from that. It was just sitting there, listening, noticing something, and then bird language is happening, sort of, yeah. on this very simple level. You don't, you wouldn't even necessarily have to be able to identify those song sparrows. You, it could have just been, you knew that they were a, a small songbird. Yes, exactly. Like, and... just the alarm call itself could indicate a lot without knowing the name of the bird. Mm-hmm. It can help. You know, the more information you have, the, you know, the more precise your interpretations can be. Right. But yeah, you, there, the threshold is very low. I guess is kind of what, the point we want to emphasize yeah. for being able to observe and understand bird language. Yeah. And I think one of the things, that one of the possibilities of bird language is that I might not have ever seen the coyote, mm-hmm. but I could have known that it was a coyote. There's... You know, there's people, there's experiences that people have where they know those kind of things without seeing the coyote through the bird yeah. language. And so that's kind of like our goal in practicing bird language is to is to be able to have those kind of experiences out in nature, right? Like, and that's mm-hmm. why you as a naturalist should, you should be quote, <laughs> interested in this stuff, right? Like mm-hmm. that that story, those kind of th- experiences are amazing and they're so fun and, and it's just great learning experiences about the way sort of like the ecosystem of the communication networks work in, uh, in nature. So, and that we can tap into that and, and gain some cool 
cool insight and and see some cool stuff using that. I mean, I know that people use bird language, you know, hunters, wildlife photographers use bird language. They might not even call it bird language, but they use that kind of mm-hmm. stuff to get photographs or get dinner or whatever. And um, so th- I, I hope that that lands on you as a listener, as something that you'd be interested in, in learning about. Um, I'm interested. I'm interested. Oh, we got Stefan. Yes. Stefan's in. Yes. So w- just as we did in our first episode, where we, we were going to tackle the question, what is a naturalist? We basically, p- we live in the information age and Google receives a lot of questions. Like when you first have a question, you, you pose the question to Google. And so we did that um, in episode one, and we're going to do that again with the question, what is bird language? Yeah. I, um, I like to think and, of it as if like you were at the bar or if you were at some pl- like the gym and you heard somebody say from across the room, <laughs> Bird language. Just the, the, <laughs> the, the phrase came up. What would you do in that situation? What would you at do? At the gym. <laughs> You're at the gym. Just follow me on this, from okay? Across the room. Bird language. <laughs> Just hypothetically. No, I you get it. Put yourself in that situation. What are you going to do? You're going to pull out your phone or your whatever your device, and you're going to find Google. And you're going to be like, what the hell is this bird language stuff? <laughs> and why is that guy so excited about it? So it's <laughs> – so we, and we got some good feedback on episode one on this too as, as just a format because I think people, people do learn a lot from the internet. And, it, and it's kind of like a good metric to see what, what the world thinks bird language is. So, yeah. so we Googled it. That's, that's all you need to know. We Googled it. And, and we're going to go through some of the, some of the things that the, wor- that the internet thinks – what bird language is, you know, mm-hmm. given the story I just told, let's see how, let's see how that, how that differs or, or is similar. Yeah. And we're going, we're going at this with an open mind. It's not, you know, we're, we're not necessarily taking what we read as like, okay, that's what bird language is. Um, but we're also <laughs> not going to, you know, prejudge and, you know, we, we, we really are sort of open and, and searching for what we feel like the, the most helpful definition is going to be. So with that, I Googled it. And I, I googled what is bird language, and the first link that comes up is the language of the birds wiki. So mm. there's a Wikipedia page called the language of the birds, and actually I, a lot of this stuff I didn't know, but basically there's a long-standing mythology in human history of this thing called that we call bird language, that wiki seems to call the language of the birds, but basically there's a bunch of different myths throughout history, Greek, Norse, biblical, Persian, Russian, about people who had the skill to talk to the birds and gain information. That is a, a constant among these stories as I look, read through this article and followed up on other things. For instance, Odin's ravens, Hugin and Munin. <laughs> I don't know if that's how you pronounce those, <laughs> but it's sweet because Odin's ravens, they're job was to fly around the world and then return to Odin and give him information about what was going on in the world. I mean, that's so awesome, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Literally. Bring the information. That was what they did. And that's I, so sweet. What I love about what I love about that particular story is that, you know, so, so much of, of what, where bird language comes from is all about like efficiency. And I feel like, Odin, why, like, there's no reason Odin couldn't just, like, go or go to the places in the world that he, where he wanted to, like, gather information and, like, do it himself. But it's so much more efficient for him to have Hugin and Munin to go fly out. He's, 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 like, at home and the, these ravens fly out and come back and bring him information about what's going on and what things are like elsewhere. Exactly. It's just all about energy efficiency, man. Like, and so that's, you might not. Sorry, just like you might not have seen that coyote had you not been alerted to the the fact that something was up. Yeah. By song sparrows, right? Yeah. Basically song sparrows are like my Hugin and Moonin. <laughs> <laughs> but actually Norse mythology, you know, in my research has a lot of bird language as a superpower. Basically the language of the birds is a superpower in mythology. And one of the interesting <laughs> Uh, trivia pieces I found was that 
in some of Norse mythology, you can obtain the superpower of bird language, of knowing the language of the birds and being able to talk to them by drinking dragon's blood, <laughs> which I think is awesome. Of course. Yes. So it, we just need to find some dragon's blood, man. <laughs> Pick up some dragon's blood. You don't even this need this podcast. Just get blood. yourself some dragon's blood. Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot, lot in Norse mythology. You know, biblically, Solomon apparently the you know that biblical figure, his very wise figure in in the Bible, he was able to talk to the birds. And then there's Saint Francis, of course, who is famous for being able to, you know, sit in a garden. You know, he had this practice, I guess, of sitting in a garden and and the birds would just land on him. You know, it's, you know, that's not really bird language, maybe, but it's just interesting to look back and see how humans have sort of created this myth- mythos around people who can communicate with birds, people who have a relationship with birds, and there's definitely a strong thread of it being sort of a superpower. Yeah, so so really it's it's a long-standing tradition and cultural understanding that birds ha- have information that can benefit us yeah. and uh, that, you know, that's why it shows up across cultures and, you know, th- through in all these old stories and things that have been passed down. It's like that is, yeah, sort of ancestral knowledge, right? <laughs> exactly. And this is something we're going to dive deeper on this next next episode. So the second link is actually pretty relevant. It's called birdlanguage.com. There's a website called birdlanguage.com, and actually I really recommend it. There's a lot a lot of really cool stuff there. There's a blog. There's an audio library. There's events, and one of the events is one of the classes I'm teaching, uh, the New England Bird Language Intensive. You know, it's got a lot of resources. And one of the things I found on birdlanguage.com, which is great, it's not I don't think it's a definition, but they have a pay, they have a under the discover tab, they have a what is bird language question and section. I mean, and it's kind of long. I'm not going to lie. And that's going to be a theme, I guess, in as we go along that a lot of the places that teach bird language have sort of long-winded explanations for what it is. And that's one of the purposes of this podcast is to sort of break it down and really refine it so that it's more digestible. But essentially, and I found this through Googling bird language, their definition is as follows. Or I don't know if it's called a definition, but their thing is interpreting bird language is an art form. The calls, postures, and other behaviors of birds convey much information to those who understand their patterns. The attentive, trained observer can deduce through bird language the location of predators and other forces on the landscape. Pretty good. I like it. Yeah. What do you think, Stefan? Um, yeah, I think I think that it's fairly concise, which I appreciate. I think a lot of a lot of what's out there, you know, like you know, going back to the basketball comparison, there, there's a lot of information about bird language that goes down the road of diving right into the rules to try and you know describe what bird language is and i feel like this definition does a better job it's much clearer sort of it's more trying to to go for what actually is it not just how you know how does it manifest itself and and how do you experience it yeah i mean an observer a trained observer can deduce location of predators by you know understanding the calls postures and behaviors of birds I think that's pretty pretty succinct. I you know, you'll we'll get to it, but there's some things missing there that I think are key, but right. I you know, again, I don't think that they I don't think that they had the same intention as we did when they wrote that either. I don't think they meant to encompass everything that it is, which mm-hmm. I think is our goal, it's a lofty goal, but there it is. And but it, I think it's a good stepping point, stepping stone <laughs> yeah. to get to where we want to go, which is which is something I think a little more refined. But Check it out. So, they have a whole page on bird la- on what is bird language, and I think it's worth reading. And, it, you know, what were you going to say, Stefan? Just that I think that some of the important things in there are are the the observation and deduction mm-hmm. kind of piece. Yeah. I think Agreed. that's central to what bird language is as a practice. So, for you know, for naturalists, the 
the uh, making observations and interpreting those obs- observations in a way that allows you to deduce things that are going on that you might not be sensing directly. And that's that's the key thing. Birds have they have this information. They're they have sensory awareness that is goes beyond you know our own personal bubble. Right. And so in order to kind of bring that in, we have to interpret what what's what's going on with yeah. them. Yeah, and I think um, with the deer coyote story from earlier, like I didn't actually interpret anything. I just observed and things mm-hmm. happen. But the thing is the next like say I'm sitting there again the next morning and the same thing happens or something very similar, I have that experience to bounce off of. And so yeah. I don't necessarily think bird language is always like interpret it's not always interpreting stuff that isn't going on. That's kind of like one of its goals. But we can gather this data by being good observers and mm-hmm. then use it in future experience too. So, yeah. And that's the, tr- that's the trained observer piece in that yeah. I think is, is really important because it's the more that that training is just you, you going out there and listening and observe, you know, making observations. That's how you get that training. It's not as there, there are certain things that there has been a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of legwork done by people who study bird language to help you kind of make make those interpretations or, you know, interpret what you're observing. But right. it's not it's not as cut and dry as like when they do this, that means this. When they do this, yes. that means this. Right. And I think there are there are general some generalities apply, but it, it's always important to remember that you establishing what is I, I guess I'm going to throw this word out there. Baseline. What's baseline in yeah. your in spot where you're making yeah. your observations, and so then you detect when things are out of out of that baseline. Yeah, context is critical here. I always liken bird language and other parts of being a naturalist to to po- a poker game a little bit. In that, you know, if you just did the same thing with every hand every time, if you just interpreted the birds the same way every time they did certain behaviors, no matter where you were, no matter what the context, that's really, you're going to be a terrible poker player and you're going to be really bad at bird language. (laughs) So like if I always go all in on double aces, like that's a really bad heuristic. (laughs) It sound it's like it, it were, it would work like 80% of the time, but that 20% of the time I'm going to get hosed. So I would just think about bird language as like you really need to think about the nuances and the context, like like Stefan's saying. So the next the next link is pretty cool. It's Turkey's bird language, and Turkey is in the country, not the bird. <laughs> um, so it turns out, and this is there's a bunch of hits on this actually. <laughs> in Turkey, there's a language that is like a whistled language. So people whistle this language through like this really hilly area of Turkey, I guess near, near the black sea where the people, you know, it's really hilly. It's hard to move around and get up and down. So it's much easier. It's been easier over the generations to whistle things because I guess the whistling travels farther than yelling. Right. And actually I'm in, I'm in one Valley and you're in the next Valley over. We can't see each other. And and you have you have something you need to tell me, right? And you whistle it. Yeah, exactly. And they actually whistle some pretty complicated things, like like oh, is my dog down there? Kind of thing, or like <laughs> I don't know, just some things that you'd be like, wow, how can you communicate that through whistling? Pretty awesome. And so, it's, but it's called bird language. They call it a bird like bird language there. And so it's that's its sort of name. And that's why it comes up when you say, what is bird language? And sadly enough, though, the United Nations Cultural Heritage Agency has recently like called this bird language endangered, an endangered part of world heritage because... Cell phones. Cell phones, exactly. Why do I need to whistle something when I can text it to you? Yeah. So it's really that's really fascinating to me that the this tech the technology is now making the whistled language sort of sort of non existent, not unnecessary, and uh it's 
unfortunately slowly dying off and as as things tend to do it's only the older generations that are doing it now and and it's not really getting passed along so sad but but pretty cool pretty cool that that exists I'm really ex- neat i think as far as like our what we're driving at i don't think that's necessarily in the <laughs> realm of of what we're calling bird language but kind of a neat thing you know that just happens to pop up yeah pretty sweet some of the other things that come up are wilderness schools that teach this bird language stuff and you know that's where we got sort of our schooling in this stuff you know from white pine programs mainly for me and stefan but um you know other schools that are related like wilderness awareness school and alder leaf college and things like that have you know some some stuff on their websites about bird language explaining it things like that but you know again I'm, I, they don't have a definition, and I'm not going to be. I'm not really going to be able to read much of anything because they're really long. They're like you know whole articles, I guess. Yeah. You know, and that's their intention is to to write an article and to to explain this sort of in depth. But it and does, they're, and they're worth reading. Definitely, they're they're worth reading, and and if you're interested in in learning about bird language, that will uh you, that will definitely help. Uh, but as far as defining you know giving that sort of like so hey what is bird language and you can just kind of rattle rattle off you know in a concise manner this is what bird language is and and have it be something that that most people will be able to understand like what you mean by that is not it's not very helpful to hand them an article yeah i think that's we we, we're seeking some clarity and um you know although these are these are great resources these these websites these pages they they're leaving us hanging, just like when we did the naturalist podcast. There were things, mm-hmm. you know, what is a naturalist? There were things that left us hanging that we felt like we really just kind of want to get down to it, you know. And and I did when when we wrote the definition, we did st- like pilfer, you know, words and phrases from these things to try and piece together what we're what we're going to define bird language to be, you know. And I just want to acknowledge that and give them you know credit for that. You know, we didn't t- steal anything. <laughs> word for word, but definitely there are a lot of elements that we wanted to tie together to put to put that in. Yeah, so most of these things that we're mentioning all informed our our process for developing a definition. So one, there's two videos I wanted to mention before we move on to mm-hmm. to our own definition. The first one, I'll start with this one. So if you Google right. what is bird language, the first video that comes up, not. Not the second, not the third, yeah. the first. For me, it's the fourth link down. Yeah. <laughs> the first video, fourth link, is this video called Undertanding Bird Language. That's right. Wait, what is it? Undertanding Bird Language. So there's a little okay. misspelling, you know, it's, it's okay. It's, we, give them, we give them a break for that. And then it's a, yeah. <laughs> have an iPhone video <laughs> of a guy walking around his yard, <laughs> like harassing a robin, basically. It's pretty funny. I mean... It, it kind of bothers me on one level that there that that's like the first hit for bird right. language video yeah. wise because it's like come on like there need people need you know video people come on make some content about about bird language I mean <laughs> I I would love to but you know we're not there yet we're not there um, we would we would love it if there was yeah and the main the my my main beef with that is is not that it's not really what it is exactly, but that there's no explanation of, yeah. you know, it's, it's, there's no, there's no, uh, he doesn't yeah. say, so I'm, I'm hearing a, a robin tutting, you know, this, that they may be, uh, sort of by in, me. in some sort of territorial <laughs> dispute or, you know, there's no, there's no explanation at all. It's just a guy walking around his yard, yeah. uh, and videotaping it. Yeah. It's, so it's not that great content. It doesn't, you know, for, <laughs> for a video that is, is, the the title of which is understanding bird language. It doesn't it doesn't help you understand bird language no. at all, um, especially if you don't already know yeah. if you've never even heard of bird language. So and probably not, talking about the video isn't helping you understand bird language either. But no. <laughs> but I think True. but I think we want we just yeah that's we want to mention that. Okay, so we're, the other video yeah is uh, the Cornell Lab video, which I think is called Language of the Birds, right? I think it is, yeah. And this is a great 10-minute video about, you know, bird. it's basically about bird language. And it's breaking down some stuff. It's got some great animations, got a great uh, script. 
Um, it's really emphasizing the listening aspect of bird language, which I appreciate tremendously. Yeah. Um, you know, focusing on that being the main practice, I think is key. The li- using your ears. If you want to learn bird language, use your ears. But I really recommend this. We'll put that. I will put that video link in the description for the podcast, so you can find that there. But if you don't want to click on that, just check out the Cornell Lab video. Just Google uh, bird language Cornell Lab or language mm-hmm. of the birds Cornell Lab, and that will come up. So just wanted to mention that that's a sweet resource um, just to, to give a quick explanation. So, Yeah. One thing I love about that video, Matt, that I'll just quickly mention, is they do a great job of, of illustrating that our minds are already geared to receive bird language agreed yeah. and that we're, we're just trained we're we're trained to recognize and respond to certain sounds or certain you know body language that are relevant to our daily lives and so like you know I've, i i often think of it as we we already have the hardware for this stuff and we just need to download the software yeah uh, I think you know, the bird language version because you know they they do the telephone thing like you you hear a telephone ring and you you have sort of an automatic understanding of what that means and maybe what your response to that should be maybe that means that you should go pick that phone up you know like you you know um, yeah you oh yeah I did like sound. that that metaphor um, and I and I think that they they illustrated that in a really 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 good way um, yeah really helpful I almost um, wish it, they went into more depth on that but. Yeah, it's a really good resource, and our de- our written definition reflects that video in a lot of ways. So, I guess might as well dive into it, huh? Yeah. What is our written definition? Okay. Matt? So this is a working definition. So please, if you have any feedback for us, we really welcome that. But our definition of bird language, and remembering back to the story with the deer and the coyote, and all the elements of the song sparrow's communication there. Here's the definition. Bird language is a universal language, best learned by observing birds. Naturalists who study bird language integrate observations of bird vocalizations, body language, and ecological context with personal experience and ancestral knowledge to detect, infer, and predict changes in the environment. So there's a lot to unpack there. We really tried to cram it in, of course, because that was our goal. But... Universal language, right? It doesn't, bird language isn't all about birds necessarily, actually. Because yes. think about the deer and the coyote, you know, or at least the deer in the story. The deer is communicating something. Why is it moving in this direction? Like that is a ripple from the coyote, mm-hmm. you know? So that is actually bird language. Um, and we just need to remember that. But it is best observed, this, this stuff is best observed by, uh, or learned by observing birds. I mean, it's like Stefan said. In the beginning, when we were answering Jake's question, you know, birds are obvious. In other words, they're like all around, they're always around, and they're out during the day, and they're doing all kinds of things just in plain sight. So you're going to be able to spend a lot of time observing them if you really put the time in. Whereas other other creatures that may also participate in bird language are less easily observable. Yeah, exactly. and and therefore you know you fall back on birds. I think what one uh, one non avian uh, example of like good some some good ones to look at uh, for observing bird language are squirrels. Yeah, yeah. Squirrels participate in bird language. Chipmunks, um, and they're, act, they're you know they're active during the day. You know you probably see a lot of squirrels. You know whether you live in the country or in the city, and and so those they're you know they're they're kind of in that same category of like easily observed. Right. Uh, they, they're vo- very vocal. <laughs> oh yeah. So, so yeah. And then naturalists who study bird language. So I feel like if you're not, if you're studying bird language, you pretty much are, a na- you must be a naturalist. Like being a bird language naturalist or b- bird language practitioner is like a subset of naturalist kind of. Mm-hmm. And then, what what are we doing when we're doing bird language? What am I doing when I'm sitting there listening to the song sparrows go off about that deer and the coyote? I guess, you know, I'm observing the vocalizations, the body language, and the context. Those are like the three things that I'm observing 
And then I'm like putting those pieces together. You know, sometimes you don't have the body language. Sometimes you're in a new area and you don't have that much context. Maybe there's some bird language situations and stories that involve no vocalizations. I think that's possible. But those are like the three part, three things that are, you're really like, you're putting those things together. You're, that's in the observation quadrant of our naturalistics triforce, right? Mm-hmm. And then you're also adding these two other pieces in your personal experience. So, you know, it, again, if I'm back by that marsh with the deer and the coyote, you know, I had that experience to bounce off of. And, you know, now from now on, you know, if a similar situation comes up, that personal experience is there with me and I can integrate that into, you know, my observations. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is this ancestral knowledge piece, which I'm up for renaming it. We really wanted to mention this because yeah, there's a, like, like in the Cornell lab video, there's an element of our humanity of who, who we are just biologically that knows this stuff like that we've been evolving and living in the, in nature for millions of years. And so there's a part of us that just kind of, when the song sparrow starts alarming, we look over there, right? We don't like, if we're tuned in in any kind of way, we're going to be, we're going to be honing in on those alarm sequences <laughs> and they might even cause a, like a emotional reaction or a, you know, intu intuitive reaction sort of within yeah. us. That's not really explainable with, well, I heard this, and so I knew it was that, and then this happened. So, like, it's l it's less cerebral and more intuitive. Yeah, and I think the reason I I think we'll we'll dive into more of this on the next part of this series, but I think it's you know the reason why we have this ancestral knowledge and the reason why that's part of our experience of bird language is because bird language represents a game that yeah. is constantly being played. And it's a game that human beings have been part of. Like, we yeah. are part of that game. And, you know, even, you know, through, like, modern sort of self-domestication, we've sort of extracted ourselves from that game in a, in a lot of ways. Yeah. But we're, like, that's only, re like, a blip in the history of human evolution. Yeah. And most of, most of everything that we are it has been a part of this game. Right. And that's why we're just like we're ready to go. You're you regardless of your experience of like bird identification, your understanding of any of this stuff, like you're already as a human being, you're already like programmed essentially to understand bird language. Yeah, agreed. And that and that's and that's why it's in our definition. Like it's really important that that's in, in the definition to me because if it's all just heady stuff and like interpreting bird communication then it's not the same as a bird language a language is like when i talk to somebody i'm interpreting their body language and like feelings and like expressing emotions and there's so many things going on there that are intuitive and sort of i guess ancestral and it's the same with bird language that's why it's called bird language and not bird communication um Agreed. The last part of our definition is what it, like what's its, what's bird language doing? What are its goals? Detecting, mm -hmm. inferring, predicting changes. You know, so so this is that deduction piece from that we pulled from birdlanguage.com. You know that that's the the end result. Yeah, is that you're picking up on things that you that weren't necessarily obvious. So, you know, knowing where the that a hawk is going to fly over because the chipmunk gave a hawk alarm call is a really obvious example. Yeah. But, but you, the, but the thing here is that there's like a, there's like a, the, the, wh whatever it is, there's like a middleman. Yeah. You're not directly observing this hawk necessarily. You might, you know, if it, if it's, you know, predict, you know, if the chipmunk is alarming that the hawk is, you know, the chipmunk has detected the hawk. You haven't detected the hawk yet necessarily, yeah. but through that chipmunk, now you, you know, you've like extended your net. Yeah. Of sensory awareness. Exactly. Um, to pick that up. Yeah. And that's its goal. So, you know, that's the whole definition in a nutshell. You know, I think one of the things I just wanted to mention before we sign off is the hazards of bird language being like that we can make it really cerebral on the one hand and we can just like overthink things and, th and overanalyze 
in our mind and our you know and think that everything's got to be like pieced out like a puzzle and then there's the other hazard of like being overly intuitive and just thinking oh i feel this and that and that's why the birds are doing Mm -hmm. this like you know you need a little bit of both and it's going to be a nuanced learning practice for people but it's important that they're both there that's what i think yeah that's what i think that's in case you were wondering that's what matt thinks (laughs) um yeah so yeah, a lot, lot more to dive into. Hopefully f- folks aren't g- walking away from this feeling unsatisfied. We are going to um, <laughs> we are going to continue with this topic. Uh we wanted to break it up so it didn't feel too heavy and it, it was it would have been a bear to do all at once. So next episode, episode 17, we will be tackling in the next part of this which is why does bird language exist? Yeah, it should be so, awesome. We're going to talk about, you know, like the biologic like some of the ecological papers and stuff like that that have to do with like communication systems in in nature and then also talking about more of that mythology of bird language kind of stuff so should be cool we're excited to to deliver that one and um yeah so and also just a reminder to check out the patreon patreon.com slash naturalistics we're excited to launch that and if you have a dollar send us a dollar we love it and if not we'll we will continue to produce our episodes and they'll still be there for you either way yep and want to just thank you for listening send us your comments reactions thoughts concerns you can email us at us at naturalisticspod at gmail.com and uh thanks again great